Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, Martha Capwell Fox, author of Geography, Geology, and Genius. Martha Capwell Fox is the author of the book Geography, Geology, and Genius, How Coal and Canals Ignited the American Industrial Revolution. Now, your book explores the history of the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor. Where is that and what, what counties does it include? Well, the corridor encompasses the five counties going from north to south of Luzerne, Carbon, Lehigh, Northampton, and Box. And the reason for that particular uh, configuration is that this traces the historic uh, transportation pathway of anthracite coal from mine to market uh, via canals at first and then later by railroads. Uh, well, let's talk about anthracite coal. It uh, seems to be like the centerpiece or at least a starting point of of a lot of the building that was going on in that region. When did people first discover anthracite coal in that area? Yeah, yeah, the whole story does really begin with anthracite. Now, anthracite was actually discovered mostly up in the Wyoming Valley, Luzerne County, that sort of area. Um, as early as the uh, mid 18th century, uh, we just celebrated the 250th anniversary of the uh, first recorded industrial use of anthracite, which happened um, in uh, 1768, actually. So it was 250 years ago. And that was by a, a team of brothers in what the area that's now Wilkes-Barre, um, who were blacksmiths. And there are recordings here and there of it being used as a fuel for blacksmithing. Um, but it wasn't really begun to be seriously mined until it was discovered in 1792 um, on the top of Sharp Mountain, at what is now the town of Summit Hill in Carbon County. And it was, it was discovered in various places. Most of the stories have an element of legend to them, but the common factor in all of them um, is that the, uh, the anthracite was so abundant that virtually everybody simply found it on the ground. And it was just cropping up out from underneath what amounted to the topsoil there. So that's an example of exactly how abundant anthracite is, in fact, still is, uh, in this part of Pennsylvania. Um, it's down pretty deep now, and there are a whole variety of reasons why it's not commercially viable anymore. But uh, the, the, the plain fact is, is that of all the handful of places that anthracite occurs around the world, Northeastern Pennsylvania is still and always was the richest possible source of it. Uh, the area in the car in the Carbon County called the Panther Valley is actually the site of something known as the Mammoth Vein. So to give you an idea of exactly uh, how large the deposits were. But the anthracite is actually the, the start of the story. What is uh, significant about anthracite? How, what distinguishes it from other types of coal? Well, anthracite, um, if, if you're talking about solid fuel, anthracite is the best one that there is because it's a very, very high carbon content. And um, it produces um, a long lasting and very hot heat. When they started to use anthracite um, for industrial purposes, as a matter of fact, it was the hottest fuel that anybody had ever used to that point. Um, and that really changed a lot of things, metallurgy and chemistry and uh, a lot of other sciences that apply to that kind of industry. So um, anthracite also burns very cleanly in terms of not leaving much in the way of soot and it doesn't smoke. So those are its advantages. Of course, what we know now about the, uh, the problems with burning anything carbon-based um, has sort of put the whole thing in a bad light. But at the time, it was an enormous and important breakthrough in um, energy and in the way people could not only make things, but also in the way that they could live, heat their houses, cook, et cetera, things like that. When did people realize its value for industrial work? I mean, was it evident right away or did it take some time to figure that out? <laughs> it, it took a really long time to figure it out. And a lot of that was because 
there was really no need for it. I mean, here we are sitting in Penn's woods, right? And there was no need for an alternative fuel to wood in Pennsylvania for the first 125, 130 years of European settlement because there was plenty of wood and it didn't really matter. Now, people who were educated in the American colonies and, and, and in the later United States realized that the era of wood as, its, as a fuel had already ended in Britain and they had been using coal uh, as their industrial fuel since the early 1700s. And that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Britain. But in this country, there wasn't this sort of pressing need for it because if you needed heat or fuel to uh, turn into charcoal and to make iron with, there was plenty of wood. This changed in the early 19th century when the most of the easily accessible hardwood, which is what you need to make charcoal to make iron with, and the better wood for heating and building houses and everything like that, started to become really, really scarce. It's hard to believe when you look at Pennsylvania now, which is really pretty green again, that uh, the, the middle part of Pennsylvania, the east, um, eastern part and west of the Susquehanna, as well as the matching part in New Jersey, had basically been clear cut. So by the early 19th century, um, in cities like Philadelphia in particular, they really had an energy crisis on their hands because wood was becoming scarce and it was becoming expensive. So that was what got people interested in this discovery that had actually happened in the 1790s of anthracite coal up there in what's now Carbon County. The problem was, was getting it from up there in Carbon County where virtually no one lived, um, and Car Carbon County didn't even exist at that point, um, all the way down to market in Philadelphia. And that was the real challenge for getting the anthracite business going. The other thing was that there was a fair amount of skepticism about it because anthracite's really hard and it's very hard to get it to catch fire. So a lot of people figured it was just a stone. They didn't have any concept of anthracite as fuel. So there was a fair amount of resistance to even beginning to adopt it. And um, that slowed things up considerably too for the people who were investing money in trying to mine it, which wasn't all that difficult because you could just quarry it basically. But getting it out of those uh, way northeastern quarries where they were finding it and getting it to where there was a sizable audience of people to pay for it was another story. So that was why it really didn't develop as an industry for 20 years after it was first discovered. Now this challenge of uh, transporting the coal from Northeast Pennsylvania to someplace like Philadelphia uh, brought a couple of key figures, Josiah White and Erskine ha Hazard. Uh, who were they and what, what role did they play in, in, this, uh, in the development of this area? Well, Josiah White and Erskine Hazard were an amazing duo, really. Um, White was a Quaker. And uh, he was really a self-made man, he, and a very ambitious one. He did not have a tremendous amount of formal education, but as a young man, he apprenticed himself to a relative in Philadelphia who was in the hardware business. And he learned enough of the hardware business in a short period of time that he went into business for himself in his early 20s. And he set himself the goal of making $40,000. Now, this is in 1815 money. Um, that he could retire at 30 and then do good with the money that he had because $40,000 was just an enormous fortune. And um, he, he did sort of make that, but it, it, the, that process fell off the rails for a variety of reasons. Um, but after he lost his wife, which was one of the first things that sort of derailed his life plan, he met Erskine Hazard. Now Hazard was from a totally different background. He was from a very wealthy Philadelphia family. His father had been the second postmaster general of the United States. And he had also founded one of the very first insurance companies. So they were very well connected, to say the least. And the two of them together went into business opening a wire and nail mill on the banks of the Schuylkill, um, a little bit outside of Philadelphia. It's in the city now, but it was outside of the city. And they promptly bumped up against the fact that they started this business in 1812. 
Now, if you were going to make wire or nails in those days, you were buying bar iron and you needed some way to heat it so that you could stretch the wire, draw out the wire or chop it into nails. And at that point, the whole energy crisis had really come to a head. Firewood was even more expensive than ever. And a lot of people in Philadelphia and in the middle Atlantic states had turned to two alternative sources, both of which were bituminous coal. One source was from Virginia, up in the mountains of Virginia, where there still are some bituminous coal mines. They were mining a bit of bituminous coal. They were putting it on boats, floating it down the James River and into Chesapeake Bay and then putting it on ships and bringing it around and up through Delaware Bay and to Philadelphia, which was the biggest city in North America at that point. So this was the market that everybody was aiming for. And so there was this soft coal coming in that way. And the other way it was coming into the United States was as ballast in British ships that we were, tra that we were trading with. And that came to a screeching halt in both cases when the British blockaded the American coast in 1812, when the War of 1812 began. So now they had no coal and they had no wood. There was a little bit of anthracite making its way down to Philadelphia periodically, mostly in wagons. Now, this was not a good way to make money in the anthracite business because you couldn't carry much in a wagon and it took a really long time because there were hardly any roads north of Bucks County, basically. And so they bought a load of this anthracite coal and they put it in a furnace and fortunately for us, both Hazard and White were really good letter writers and diarists. And so we know this really kind of charming story about how they fiddled with it in the furnace in their wire mill. And they couldn't get it to light. And this was in November, which is germane in a second to the story. They put it in the furnace, they could not get it to catch fire, and they got disgusted and they gave up, shut the furnace, and everybody went home. But it turned out that one of their workers had left his jacket in the mill and when he went back to get it, he opened the door of the building and it was warm inside. And when he went and looked at the furnace, it was white hot. And somehow or another, this is unexplained, he summoned White, who then summoned his workers. Now this is not telephones. I'm not sure how one did this in the middle of the night, but they did. And they went back to work in this wonderful heat that was being generated by this load of anthracite and did a day's worth of work in a few hours because of the tremendous heat that this anthracite was, was putting out. And what they had accidentally discovered, which was also discovered in a few other places um, earlier and later, was that anthracite burns in a closed furnace with an updraft of air. And um, so this was kind of their eureka movement moment, but it took them until 1818 um, to really seriously go into the business of acquiring land where there was a mine, which in fact was the place in Summit Hill, and then um, figuring out a way to change the transportation system to using the rivers that would make it economically viable to bring this coal down to Philadelphia. Now you mentioned at one point that uh, White and Hazard leased 10,000 acres of land from the Lehigh Coal Mine Company for an ear of corn. Is that a common means of, of uh, remuneration? Th there were still, I believe this is based in old English law, it's known as a quit rent. And I think it also sort of signifies that the, the, lessee, the leaser or seller does not consider the property to be necessarily all that immediately valuable. Um, for instance, where I live in Catasauqua, we have a house that was lived in, was built by a man who signed the Declaration of Independence named George Taylor, who coincidentally was also an iron master, but much earlier than we're talking White and Hazard. And the land that that house is on and that Catasauqua is on was deeded by Letitia Penn um, to the first, the first lessor for one red rose a year to be presented on the last Sunday in June. And so this is a ceremony that gets revived periodically in Lehigh County. Um, but so yeah, the same sort of thing, 10,000 acres for an ear of corn. And that 10,000 acres is still worth a lot of money, even though not for the coal business anymore. And uh, so what they did was they actually first leased and then bought outright the quarry mine that was on top of Sharp Mountain in what's now Summit Hill. 
And uh, the problem there was that it's up there on this mountain. It's nine miles from the Lehigh River. And the only reasonable way in those days to move any kind of heavy, bulky cargo was by water. So they went to the legislature in Harrisburg and they said, look, if we can solve this problem of transporting coal, it's going to be good for the United States. It's going to be good for Pennsylvania. It's going to be good for us. Uh, and to do this, we now have a plan to make the unnavigable Lehigh River navigable. But if we're going to take this risk, you have to give us control of the Lehigh River. And the legislature said, sure, everybody goes broke in this stupid coal business. You're going to lose your shirt. They said, you have been, we're giving you the privilege of bankrupting yourselves. And um, so they got an amazing amount of control, not only of the Lehigh itself, but of the water rights, which proved to be a big deal later on, of the control of the tributaries, and basically ownership of all the land on the banks of the Lehigh for the entire run of it from above Stoddardsville down to Easton. And uh, the, unfortunately for the legislature, their dream of getting it back in a hurry didn't work out because the Lehigh was privately owned by Lehigh Coal and Navigation until 1966. And then the legislature uh, demanded the river back. So Lehigh was the only privately owned river in the United States for well over 150 years. <laughs> So you mentioned that the river was not navigable. What, what did they have to do to, to change that? Well, White was uh, an incredibly inventive man. They both were, really. And at one point, no one held more patents in the United States than Josiah White, most of which were for small tool kind of related things. But in the case of making the river useful, he uh, tapped some really ancient knowledge that involved hydrostatic dams. Now, basically what that is, is a low head dam only maybe three feet high or so. And at one end of it is a triangular gate of a sort, basically two gates that are held upright if the water is allowed to flow underneath them and hold them together. And so what they would do is they filled these flat bottom arcs, as they called them, which were basically rafts with real shallow sides. And each one of those arcs held about 10 or 12 tons of coal. And they would fill up. The, the, these flat bottom boats and with this coal, which was not a tremendous amount, link the boats together so that there would be 10 or 12 of them. And they would, um, they were really unwieldy. There would be a man in the front with a fending pole and a man in the back with what amounted to sort of a sweep oar to try to help to steer this thing. And then when they had them lined up in the deeper water behind the dam, the problem with the Lehigh is the Lehigh in a lot of places, most places, is shallow and rocky most of the time. And this is what they were trying to overcome. So somebody on the front of the first boat would have to get off, get on top of the dam, and release the, the valve that was putting water underneath the gate. With no water holding the gate up anymore, it would fall down and the rush of water would go through this sluice and all these boats would ride this sluice down to the next dam, like kind of like an amusement park ride. Um, it must have been really exciting. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it didn't work all the time, but it worked most of the time to the point where by, the, by 1820, when the system was completed, um, they were getting three out of every four boats that left Mock Chunk, which is the town in Carbon County where they uh, built this uh, facility on the river to, to load the coal. Um, and they would get it down to Easton, and then they would come down the Delaware to Philadelphia. By 1820, they were delivering 20,000 plus tons of coal to Philadelphia. And as soon as people found out exactly how great it was at heating and cooking and um, blacksmithing with it. Every bit of coal that they could deliver to Philadelphia was bought immediately. So that was really the beginning of, of widespread use, at least in one area of, of the country, of anthracite coal. Um, the trouble with this system, however, was that it was one way. Um, so they were forever having to build these boats, which was where that 10,000 acres of woodland came in. And, um, and they would float down from Mock Chunk down to Philadelphia, but they couldn't come back up. 
because of course in those days there was no motors or anything like that. And um, so the boats would get bro broken up and they would sell the lumber for construction in Philadelphia. And the boat crews would have to make their way overland all the way back up to Mok Chunk, which uh, is about 160 miles and was a really difficult trip in those days. And then they would do it all over again. So is this gate and dam system, is that, is that what the bear trap dams were, or was that something that else? Is, that is the bear trap dams, yes. There were 13 of them on the Lehigh between Mock Chunk and Easton, um, which is about 45 or 46 miles. And then once they were down onto the Delaware, which the Easton is, is at the, the mouth of the Lehigh where it empties into the Delaware, then the Delaware is considerably calmer. And um, also there were Durham boats on the Delaware. And so presumably a lot of the coal was transported that way. So, um, I mean, even big places like the University of Pennsylvania had a hospital, which was the biggest one in Pennsylvania, or probably in the United States. And they were overjoyed to have this really excellent source of heat to heat what was for that time a really big building. Plus the fact it didn't smoke. And even though, as I said, we know now that there's all sorts of nasty stuff in any kind of carbon-based bird smoke, um, people who had been living in wood smoke for all their lives just thought that was the most wonderful thing to not have to worry about smoke in the, in the skies and in, in their houses. And uh, it made it very, very popular. They uh, received the legislation and the permission to, to use the Lehigh River in 1818, and it was operational in 1820. That seems to be pretty quick for those, that type of operation, that type of construction operation back in those days. You know, it is really astounding um, uh, when, when you think about that. And, and White, in particular, who was the one who engineered that, um, in, in his diary, he talks about standing chest deep with his workers in, in the Lehigh putting together these dams. They were what were known as rock and crib dams, where you make a wooden box, essentially, and then fill it with rocks. Um, and uh, that was the way the whole dam system on the entire navigation worked, even after they, uh, they changed it into a two-way system. Um, it was a remarkable effort. But what's even more remarkable is that when they decided that this one-way system was just not economical enough anymore, plus the fact that the Erie Canal had been completed by 1825, and there was finally enough civil engineering knowledge in this country, which had not existed before, um, to construct other canals. They then abandoned the bear trap system and they began to make a two-way navigation, meaning the boat, boats, real boats could go down and then be returned back up. And how they did that was they built nine dams, um, nine solid dams this time, between Mock Chunk and Easton. And the dams did two things. They made the river behind the dams deep enough and slow enough for boats that ultimately carried as much as 100 tons of coal on them, uh, on the river itself. Um, and there are still places along the Lehigh where you can see the, the, the results of, of that kind of navigation. It was called slack water navigation on the river. And the other thing that the dams did was that they fed water into the ditch parts of the canal. And this was a really brilliant solution because it meant that, first of all, they only had to dig about 35 miles of ditch as opposed to a full 46 miles uh, from Mock Chunk to Easton. And it also meant that there was always water available to go into the ditch part of the canal. And that seems like a no-brainer, but in the 19th century, keeping canals watered was a very, very big problem. And uh, this way, as long as there was water behind those dams, there was water in the ditch part of the canal. And uh, we have some pictures, actually, that show places where there was almost no water coming over the dams, but it was all going into the canals. So it was a brilliant system. Now, one of the key figures that uh, helped with the development of this canal was Canvas White. Who was he? Canvas White was a very young man, and this is also emblematic of the, the, the humility, in a way, the personal humility that, that White and Hazard had, is that when they realized that there was help to be had, um, they tapped it. And Canvas White, who was, as I say, very young at the time, only in his late 20s, had worked on the, on the Erie Canal. And so he um, learned by doing, basically, and he had also been sent by the state of New York who built 
the, the Erie Canal to Britain to study the ways that they built the canals in Britain. And um, he came back with a lot of practical knowledge. So he basically went from canal to canal to canal and, uh, uh, and, and helped engineer a lot of the earliest canals. But one of the things that he did um, that was just like so incredibly practical when he came to, uh, to, to design and engineer the Lehigh navigation was that he pointed out to White and Hazard that they didn't necessarily have to blindly follow the route of the Lehigh River, that there were a lot of places where it was really smart to follow the terrain instead. And so there are a lot of hills that are along the banks of the Lehigh. And they routed the canal so that the ditch parts follow some of those hills. And it meant that they could use the hill as one wall of the canal. And then knowing that they needed six feet of water in the canal and that they were also going to have to line it with about two feet of really sticky clay because a lot of our soil in the Lehigh Valley is very porous, they would dig down six feet go across the 60 feet that the canal width was going to be and pile up that dirt on the other side and make the other bank of the canal. So this and a whole lot of other efficiencies, plus the fact that they managed to hire about a thousand workers who were a combination of young Irish immigrants, many of whom had survived building the Erie Canal, and they came with canvas white, and also some part-time help by a lot of local German farmers. Um, they actually constructed the 46 miles of the Lehigh Navigation in two and a half years, and they did it under budget. Um, so it opened almost five years earlier than anticipated, and they spent about a million dollars in 1820s money, not our money, but a million dollars 1820s. And they created this system that functioned very nicely until the 1930s. Now, transporting the coal uh, that long distance down to Philadelphia to sell it is one way to make money from it. The other way is to develop industry where the coal is itself. Uh, what type of industry began to develop up in that area? Well, that's exactly right. And this was the next really, really important thing they did. And this is the important part that actually is the key to the whole significance of the corridor, is the fact that um, heavy industry, heavy coal-fired industry in the United States actually began in the corridor because White and Hazard learned of an iron master in Wales who had devised a way to not only use anthracite coal to smelt iron, but the man who owned the iron furnace that he worked in had bought the patent rights from James Nielsen to the hot blast system. So the combination of the superheat from the anthracite and the anthracite heated air was allowing them in Wales to turn out really large quantities of really high quality iron much faster than any of the uh, coal fired furnaces that had been operating in Britain for a really long time. Now, like I said earlier, ed educated Americans were well aware of the fact that um, the United States was more than 100 years behind Britain in terms of being able to produce heavy industrial products. Basically, the United States was an agrarian and to a lesser extent a mercantile society. We had no real uh, industrial uh, base whatsoever. So in 1838, um, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company directed Erskine Hazard to go to Wales and to secure the patent rights for this process. Now, a lot of people had already tried to use anthracite to smelt iron. In fact, White and Hazard built a furnace in, in Mock Chunk in the late 1820s, and they tried to do it. But nobody knew how to build a furnace that was strong enough to contain the heat that anthracite makes and the heat that you need to, to smelt iron. So they blew up a lot of furnaces all up and down the route of both the Lehigh and, and the Schuylkill. Um, so they figured, OK, here is somebody who knows how to do this. So let's go find out how they do it and get the rights to do it in the United States. Well, when Hazard got to Wales and he saw the process, he realized that what they really needed to do was to have someone come to Pennsylvania and do it. And George Crane, who was the man who owned this furnace in Wales, was generous enough to suggest that Hazard talk to his ironmaster, who was a man named David Thomas. 
And so he did, and he made Thomas a very generous offer to come to Pennsylvania. And Thomas was reluctant to do it. He was well established in his industry in Britain. He had an elderly mother who he was pretty certain he would never see again if he emigrated to the United States. But his wife convinced him that their sons would have more opportunity in the United States than they would in Britain. And she was right. So he signed a five-year contract on New Year's Eve of 1838 and spent the first half of 1839 busily collecting all the equipment he was going to need to bring to Pennsylvania and build an iron furnace on the banks of the Lehigh Canal. Um, what turned out, however, was that a lot of the equipment was too big to fit in the ship. And so minus most of his equipment, but with everything in his head, um, he left for Pennsylvania in May of 1839, and he arrived in what's now Catasauqua, which was nowhere in those days, but alongside Lock 36 on the Lehigh Navigation, which had been chosen for its water power potential. And he broke ground for this furnace in August of 1839, and in what's an extraordinary scenario, um, he put the furnace into blast on the 4th of July, 1840. Um, now, this is a man who came without any of the equipment he was used to, who was forced to use a water wheel instead of a steam engine to power his blowing engines, who was, as he mentions it in his letters home, a, a Welsh-speaking island, his family, this is, in a sea of only German speakers. And he accomplished this. Um, and it, it's truly remarkable. And in the first day, 4th of July, 1840, which is the birthday of the American Industrial Revolution, he made more iron in one day than a charcoal-fired furnace could make in a week. And this was the start of the United States being able to produce iron and then later steel in large quantities in a short period of time. So this is the real significance of, of the corridor. Um, a lot of other wonderful things happened later because of this beginning um, that attracted money and investment and talented people and immigrant labor. But this is the real beginning of the significance, and it's nationally significant. Um, pretty quickly, uh, anthracite began to be used um, everywhere in eastern Pennsylvania to make iron, to the point where eastern Pennsylvania, including also places like Chester County and, uh, and, and Schuylkill County and Berks, um, produced 60% of all the pig iron that was made in the United States at the time of the Civil War. How long did it take the iron industry to just grow in this region? Oh, almost no time at all. Um, like I said, uh, if you add in the, the, some of the surrounding counties, as well as then New Jersey as well, in Warren County and, uh, uh, the, the, and, and Sussex County, uh, Morris County, um, Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey were essentially the, uh, the absolute center of iron making in the United States. Um, and that really persisted until about the 1870s. Um, and then it began to shift a little bit further west. But it really was the most important iron center. And this also led to an explosion of education um, because places like Lehigh University and Lafayette College were founded because the people who were starting to make money in this business, like Asa Packer and Ario Pardee, realized that what we needed in this country was not just the physical labor, but the people who had the engineering and metallurgic and chem chemical knowledge to mine efficiently and safely, to engineer bridges and railroads and buildings and other industrial facilities. And so the education was also a, a, a really pretty early uh, beginning of that you know, technical education um, in, in the United States. And it was as a result of all of this industry beginning to come. Now, we talked about canal building, but uh, railroads were also developing during this time period. And uh, one of the first in that area was the, the Mock Chunk uh, Gravity Railroad. When was that built? Yes, well, that's the amazing thing because the Gravity Railroad um, was being built the same time as they were building the two-way navigation. Um, so talk about spreading yourself a bit thin, but actually there again, Josiah White's genius at thinking through a situation really um, made that go a lot faster than they would have anticipated. When they first started to mine the coal up on the top of Sharp Mountain, 
they, as I mentioned, they were nine miles away from the coal docks, such as they were in Makchunk on the banks of the Lehigh River. So the most efficient way, in fact, the only way to get the coal from the mine down the mountain, because this is also about a 450 foot difference in elevation between uh, the, the mine and the river level, um, White had a road built that was the first road in the United States that was built with a standard declivity, meaning that it made the same angle of steepness all the way down the hill rather than following the terrain, you know, going up and down and weaving around all of the various obstacles in the way. It was pretty much a straight line road. You can still see remnants of it if you go hiking in the hills um, above Jim Thorpe right now. You can see where the dirt is piled up. And so it was pretty much of a straight line, a smooth, relatively speaking, <laughs> smooth, straight stone road. And when they went to build the Gravity Railroad, he simply built the Gravity Railroad right on top of it. And so the, interestingly enough, the uh, managers of Lehigh Cola Navigation who were in Philadelphia uh, uh, were kind of reluctant to think about railroads, it was a very, very new thing. The longest railroad to that point that had been built in this country was about three quarters of a mile from a mine to a quarry or something like that in Massachusetts. And here we're talking nine miles. And so um, it wasn't railroad in a way that we think of it because it was stone sleepers and, and wooden rails with uh, strap iron on top of them. But white was afraid that they would tell him he shouldn't do it. So the day they were meeting in Philadelphia, he sent his workmen out <laughs> and they started on it. And by the time he got word, because you know, let's remember that mail was about the fastest way you could get something. <laughs> by the time he found out that they had said, well, let's wait on this, they had it half done. And it was completed in, um, in, in five months. Uh, now, that was the beginning of the, 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 the first of the rail transports. Eventually, this grew into the very elaborate switchback railroad, um, which made it po a lot faster to um, get empty cars back up the mountain rather than having the mules pull them up. But, uh, but it, was, it was genius, and it was the first long-range railroad that was ever built in the United States. Now you mentioned in the book that uh, they used to transport mules down the Gravity Railroad in special cars, and you tell a story about a particular incident where a, a group of mules decided that they did not want to walk down the down, down the hill. Yes. What happened? Yes, they 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 refused to get to, to to move until their car was brought and attached to the back of the the line of cars that went down the mountain. It's one of my favorite pictures in the book is the mules riding in the car, which actually dates the, the picture. It's a little fanciful and it was written, the picture was drawn after that process was already over, but it, it was, it's from the 19th century and it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, even the mule sort of hanging over the side looking like it might be a little sick. <laughs> the rest of them look very happy and I think it's a wonderful picture. Now you also talk about the what you call the symbiotic relationship between railroads and iron companies. What was that relationship? Well, <laughs> railroads needed tracks. And that was one of the things that really was the impetus behind the expansion of the iron business. Um, the uh, a, a, a lot of uh, people who were in the iron business got really interested right away, financially interested in building railroads. And, um, and vice versa. Now, the, the really obvious one, the one that has sort of like the longest lasting impact in many ways, was Bethlehem Iron and the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Um, Asa Packer, who actually started and made his early fortune in the canal business, ultimately became the Lehigh Navigation's biggest competitor because he decided that he was going to build a railroad that followed the exact same route that the canals did from the coal, the coal fields in northeastern Pennsylvania um, down to at least to Easton and ultimately by that point, you know, Philadelphia and to New York and, and beyond. So he started to build the Lehigh Valley Railroad um, in the 1850s, uh, the mid 1850s. And as they were going along, he found that he was having to buy rails from a foundry in 
uh, Scranton that was owned by a man named Moses Taylor who was building his own railroad, which became the Lackawanna. And uh, they were, of course, in direct competition for pulling coal out of more or less the, the Wyoming Valley mines. And um, so he did not like that. And so he directed his chief engineer who had constructed the Lehigh Valley Railroad for him, uh, Robert Sayer, to start an iron company um, that would make rails for him. And um, Sayer, who had already persuaded him to move the headquarters of the Lehigh Valley Railroad from Mock Chunk down to South Bethlehem, because it would, the Lehigh Valley Railroad junctioned with the North Penn Railroad that came up from Philadelphia. So it was already becoming a major rail hub for the time, and this is before the Civil War. Um, so Sayer bought control of a sort of foundering iron company that was called Sakana, and um, he got it going slowly because the Civil War started, but his best move was that he hired a man named John Fritz, who was a brilliant metallurgist engineer who had invented a, a, a machine called the Three High Rail. And what that did was it produced better rails faster than anybody had been able to do. And he was working at the Cambria Iron Works in what's now Johnstown. And um, Fritz, uh, Fritz was persuaded to move to Bethlehem by a nice salary um, and, and Sayre's cheerleading. Um, we have a copy of a letter that he sent to Fritz to persuade him to move where he basically said that the Lehigh Valley is where it's all going to be. And um, so Fritz moved. It took them until 1863 to get it going because of the problems with manpower and materials and everything with the Civil War. But then by the end of the Civil War, Bethlehem Iron was one of the biggest rail producers. Um, and virtually their only customer was the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Um, this company was what eventually became Bethlehem Steel. Now, another industry that developed in this area was the cement industry. What, what was special about the Lehigh Valley area that, that led to this development? Well, once again, we go back to the canals, which is one of the amazing things about this. Way back when they were building the canals in the 1820s, one of the things that Canvas White had come back from Britain with was the possibly still kind of secret recipe for hydraulic cement, which had been rediscovered. It was a Roman thing to begin with, but it had been rediscovered in Britain in the 18th century. And hydraulic cement was important for canal building because it's the kind of cement that hardens under water. So this was what they used um, in building the locks in particular while they were building the two-way navigation. And it was discovered that at several places along the route of the canal, particularly in what is now northern Northampton County and northern Lehigh County, the limestone there, which was like the anthracite further north, pretty close to the surface, um, was very good for making this hydraulic cement. So there were kilns that were built on either side of uh, Lehigh Gap for a while, and then eventually most of them were built in the Northampton area and they were producing hydraulic cement in fairly small quantities for use in plugging holes in the canal and fixing stone works and things like that. And so there was this knowledge that there was this particularly good limestone for cement uh, in the area. And no one had really exploited it on a major scale, but after the Civil War, um, a man named David Saylor was persuaded by a few other businessmen to begin to explore the possibility of, uh, of a cement business. And in the process of doing that, Sailor discovered that the limestone underneath the northern parts of the Lehigh Valley in what's known as the Jacksonburg Formation is the perfect mix of different types of limestone to produce Portland cement which again was something that had been discovered in Britain, but no one had known how to do it in the United States. So there again, the establishment of the first of the cement mills very rapidly led to a whole chain of them being built. Um, mostly they attracted outside investors um, who came to the, uh, to the Lehigh Valley and began to open quarries. Um, and, and you can pretty much, if you look at a map, you can see them like, almost like beads on a string um, the Jacksonburg Formation is not very wide, but um, it's all pretty well connected. And so cement then became 
the next major industry um, that, that came to the Lehigh Valley, again, because of its natural resources and its location and the number of people who were working there or who were coming there who knew how to do that sort of work. Now, you write about how this area became a center for industrial tourism and that writers, artists, and wealthy people came and toured the region. Uh, why were writers, writers and artists coming to this region? Well, some of the writers were coming because they were attracted by the, the sort of juxtaposition of lovely scenery and, and, and heavy belching industry. Um, some people discovered it on trains on their way to other places. <laughs> um, and um, and, and the, the, the tourism kind of grew up alongside, uh, particularly when it became easier to get on a train and get out of a hot city um, like Philadelphia or New York or something, and to get to a place with lovely scenery and much cooler breezes like Mok Chunk in not a terrible amount of time, like maybe three or four hours. Um, so the railroads also made it possible to create this other industry um, which was centered on tourism, and that became a really, really important part of the economy, particularly in Mok Chunk. Um, th they were still dependent on coal, but they were really panic-stricken <laughs> uh, when Lehigh Coal and Navigation announced in the 1870s that they weren't going to use the Switchback Railroad anymore because they had built a really efficient network of trains that could get from the Panther Valley to the river and they didn't need to be relying on these little cars clattering down the mountain um, and dumping the coal directly into the, into the, the canal boats. Um, so fortunately for the town of Mok Chunk, which was already you know, pretty, pretty familiar to people who were visiting and there were a lot of hotels and things like that, um, found a series of people who were willing to uh, take control. They didn't buy it from Lehigh Coal and Navigation, but they sort of leased it. And the Switchback Railroad became this enormously popular um, destination for people because it was a really thrilling ride. I mean, it's generally credited as being the inspiration for, for roller coasters. Um, and I sometimes think now if there was ever any way that that could be built or even part of it could be built again, the line to get there would like go back to Lehighton. <laughs> and as it is on really nice weekends when there's something going on in Jim Thorpe, the line can almost all the way go back to Lehighton to get into that little town because it's in a sort of canyon, you know. Um, Mock Chunk Creek cuts down between the hills. The scenery is spectacular. The scenery is still spectacular. And, um, and now Jim Thorpe does pretty much rely on visitors. Um, and so they do a tremendous amount of promotion of visitors and most of the businesses that are there cater to visitors. And now, fortunately, as we are getting closer and closer to completing the Delaware and Lehigh Trail, the DNL Trail, which follows the, the transportation network of towpath and railbed, um, last year, after an almost 25 year effort, um, a, a footbridge uh, also for bicyclists, crosses the Lehigh, almost exactly in the same place that a very famous bridge, it was called the Mansion House Bridge, went from the Lehigh Valley Railroad on the east side of the river to the Mansion House, which was the hotel to stay in in the 19th century in, in Mok Chunk. Um, our bridge now is a little bit further upstream, but it connects the trail. And this has yielded an enormous amount of growth in the trail business, particularly this year when people are looking for things to do outside. But it also completely connected the DNL trail for uh, an expanse. Now I'm guessing here, I'm the historian, not one of the trail people. Um, but I, I'm, I think it is now a fully connected expanse from the Black, the Black Diamond Trailhead, which is way up, uh, to Cementon in the Lehigh Valley. So it's at least 60 miles. So uh, you can walk, you can bike. Some places you can ride a horse if you can bring it to it. And uh, it has really reestablished the, the, the tourism credentials, not only of Mok Chunk, but of a lot of other places all up and down the, that part of the Lehigh Gorge area. Now, one of the figures that uh, came to the area was visiting Bethlehem, journalist H.L. Mencken, 
Who is he and what, what kind of experience did he have there? <laughs> well, Mencken. Mencken has, has a wonderful story, which apparently is completely true. Bethlehem, South Bethlehem, this is, uh, which was a separate borough and grew up uh, around the steel business, the iron business and the steel business, um, was a almost completely immigrant neighborhood um, because the steel iron and the steel business grew so rapidly that by the beginning of the 20th century, um, the steel was employing about 11,000 people all entirely on that side of the river. And the population of the borough of South Bethlehem had gone from literally zero <laughs> In, in 1860 to over 25,000 by about 1910. It's said that you could hear more languages in South Bethlehem in that little area than anywhere else in the United States. And because an awful lot of those immigrants were young guys who had come either without families or ahead of their families, um, and they had money, and they worked really, really hard and long hours, and so when they got out of work finally, especially on payday, they wanted to have fun. So South Bethlehem was all full of bars and houses of ill repute and dance halls and strip halls and gambling dens. And it attracted the attention of a lot of people from outside the area. So it had this sort of sin city reputation to begin with. Now, there was an overlay of culture uh, in South Bethlehem as well that had to do with Lehigh University and uh, the earliest folks who had founded Bethlehem Iron, like the, the Sayers and the Jeters and the Lindermans, who were all related by marriage and they all belonged to the same church. Um, so there was a sort of overlay of upper class culture. But by and large, that was not the case in most of South Bethlehem. But one of the overlays was the beginning of the Bach Choir. And the Bach Choir has held a festival, although this year I guess it was virtual, every year since sometime in the 1880s. So Mencken and a companion came to Bethlehem in the 1920s during Prohibition to go to hear the Bach Choir. And then they decided afterward that they needed a little liquid refreshment too, and they persuaded a cab driver to take them to one of the numerous speakeasies that were all over not only South Bethlehem, they were in a lot of places in the Lehigh Valley, but South Bethlehem probably had one on almost every corner. And the guy wouldn't let them in because he thought that they were, they were the cops. And so it wasn't until Mencken like waved the score of the, of the Bach they had just heard in front of the peephole that they let them in. And so uh, this caused a lot of consternation on the north part of Bethlehem, which was still very dominated by the Moravians, even into the 20th century. And um, uh, there, there was a time when they were really trying to damp down the, the culture of South Bethlehem, which kind of happened to a certain extent. But um, the city moves on, and, uh, and it's still a really interesting place. Now, another industry that developed in the area was the silk industry. And how, how did that happen? Well, silk is really interesting. And I say that not only because I grew up in the silk business myself. My father actually ran the last silk mill in Allentown. But what brought silk to eastern Pennsylvania was a combination of factors. But interestingly enough, it's human resources, i.e. women and young girls and children, particularly up in the coal regions were the first real big attraction. The silk industry in the United States had basically grown up centered around Patterson, New Jersey, from also from about the 1840s. And there's a whole other story that goes to that, which we won't go into right now, partly because it didn't happen in the corridor. But by the 1880s in Patterson, there had been changes in technology and changes in the immigration profile there that meant that the old guard of skilled mostly Anglo-Saxon, a lot of them British immigrants, silk workers were not only dying off, but were being replaced because the machinery was much easier to handle than it previously had been. And the influx of Eastern European immigrants who had been working in the silk industry in Europe um, changed the profile of the industry there. The thing is, is that a lot of those folks who came from Eastern Europe were also socialists. And so for the first time, Patterson started to have labor trouble. And the silk magnates in Patterson did not like this. 
And so they started to look around for someplace else to expand into. And the first place that they landed on was the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, the coal regions, essentially. Um, it had rail connections, real easy, fast rail connections um, between Patterson and places like Wilkes-Barre and Scranton and the cities up there. And there was this vast population of women, particularly young women, who by that point had some education. They were probably kind of, you know, docile. And, and, um, and, and it was an opportunity, too, for them because it was the first time that there was uh, industrial work for women. At, up until that point, working class women were pretty much confined to things like, like housekeeping and doing laundry and maybe being bakers and things like that. It was, you know, very, very limited. So industry, as tough as it was, um, and as long hours as it was, actually paid better. So the first thing that they did was they expanded into the Wyoming Valley at Carbon County with a system that's called throwing, which is um, fairly low skill. And it's basically a process of taking raw silk, which is not very pretty and not very nice to handle, and washing it and twisting it and washing it some more and twisting it some more until it's turned into yarn that is the right thickness and has other properties to be made into various types of silk goods. And like I said, this had become, because of the changes in the machinery, unskilled labor. And so first they moved that into the coal regions and then they began to expand weaving into the Lehigh Valley because there was an influx of uh, a lot of German and Austrian people who were also coming out of the same industry there. So it eventually evolved into almost a three-tier uh, industry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries where most of the throwing was done in the northern counties, most of the weaving was done in Northampton um, and, and, and Lehigh and Berks counties, also Warren County, New Jersey, and the silk knitting business uh, came into Bucks County. And the whole industry operated in, Phil in Philadelphia. Uh, somebody really needs to do a good study of the silk industry in Philadelphia. It was enormous. So by 1913, Pennsylvania as a whole surpassed Patterson as the silk center, silk manufacturing center of the United States. And that was the same year that the United States became the leading silk goods producer of the world. So this was another thing that Eastern Pennsylvania, where it had been the iron center for a while, um, it had the second largest steel company, it was the cement producing center of, of, of the United States for about 25 years. And then it was the leading silk producer from 1913 until 1930. So um, it was one thing after another. And it was a combination of the know-how, the money, the investment money being available, the labor force, um, and uh, it just led to a tremendous amount of prosperity, um, unequal, of course, as it always is, but um, a tremendous amount of a whole variety of industries that uh, actually still persist in the corridor. No enormous dominant ones anymore, but they, but they still persist. Well, we are out of time. We've been speaking with Martha Capwell Fox. She is the author of the book Geography, Geology, and Genius, How Coal and Canals Ignited the American Industrial Revolution. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.